Good evening, everyone. Welcome inside to the first inaugural episode of the uh, Midlife Pilot Podcast. Uh, we're glad you're here. Uh, my name is Chris Moran. Many of you know me uh, from uh, the YouTube channel, The Midlife Pilot. I've had my private certificate for about a year, got it at the age of 42, and um, that's kind of what this podcast is going to be about, is um, learning to fly at this stage of life and some of the things that go along with that. And uh, I want to bring in my friend and co-host uh, and creator of the Midlife Pilot podcast, uh, Brian Siskind. He is also a Midlife Pilot from the greater Nashville region of this nation. Uh, even newer a uh, private pilot than me just got his certificate here recently and um, so we're looking forward to getting this thing started aren't we I'm glad you're here I'm glad you came up with the idea I just want to be like you when I grow up Chris well yeah. that's uh I don't know <laughs> I don't know about all that it's uh no it's it's an honor to do it uh, and I think that there is a place for um, you know I, I guess we're middle age is is that the whole thing midlife yeah, sounds fair. better I suppose. Um, <laughs> middle aged, uh, like fine wine, but um, but yeah. So I I did it uh, started when I was forty eight, finished when I was forty nine. My birthday happened in the midst of it, but um, yeah, man, it's 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 uh, I think there's a lot of people that are uh in the same kind of spot as we are, and that's who we like to sort of commune with. For sure, and I think I think there's a lot of us. That's kind of I think one of the things I found out that was most surprising about the YouTube channel uh, community that we've kind of created here is that I was surprised just how many people were doing this exact same thing that there really were who were interested in kind of finding others like them. So we're excited uh, to be adding one more component to this whole kind of network now with the um, with the podcast that's getting started. So which reminds me, <clears throat> a couple of quick uh, housekeeping items to get out of the way up front. If you're joining us tonight, kind of the way we're going to do this is we have a topic we're going to talk about. We're going to kind of field questions all the time, but we'll save a bunch of time later on to just interact with you. We think that's a huge part of how this show is going to kind of develop is going to be, at least for these first couple episodes, just through the chat mechanism. I think ultimately we'll probably have some other ways to get um, content, maybe audio, video ways we can get other people on. And we're certainly going to do some guests throughout the time, but do ask those questions in chat and interact with us that way because that's going to be a big part of the content. Um, you can also use, uh, it won't be an issue maybe tonight, depending on how busy things get. We also certainly welcome you to use the super chat feature. If that's something you're interested in, uh, it kind of guarantees your question is going to get uh, brought up, but also helps support the channel and the podcast and pay for some of the expenses too. You can do that if you want. If not, don't do it. Totally fine. Um, the other thing to mention, and uh, we talked about it just very briefly when we were inadvertently having a pre-show tonight, which was completely by accident, um, is that this podcast is going to be available just like any other podcast that you subscribe to everywhere, effectively. Um, we'll kind of announce social media and in other places when this first episode uh, gets published and pushed out so that you can go search for it. But it'll be everywhere you normally could get podcasts now. So you'll be able to go find it, subscribe to it. Um, and do that. Is all that accurate? Would you say? Yeah. I mean, we can be your, your friends on your commute, you know, uh, just, uh, or whatever. I mean, I, I, th I like the idea of the time that we're kind of working to, you know, it's not like the endless podcast that could, could go on for three hours. We try to keep it pretty tight to an hour and, and, uh, that's healthy enough to really bring in a lot of other people's questions, but at the same time to dig into things a little bit more meaningfully, because I mean, I think that we spend a lot of time uh, you know, obviously pilots love to talk, but I mean, at the same time, people have a lot of questions. People have a lot of, uh, curiosities about, um, how to go about it. You know, we want to be instructive on some level, but maybe only in the things that we're uniquely qualified to talk about, which I think is more about coming at it from this position in life. And then also, um, uh, we both are media film, uh, type of, uh, producers. And so I think that, um, that's where I think we'll be able to really, uh, speak with some sort of authority, but obviously all disclaimers, we're not uh, experts in anything other than being middle-aged or I'm sorry, <laughs> midlife and, uh, and doing the best we can. But I think that there's, uh, I think we kind of talked about it a little bit last week on your live chat, but basically I think there's, there's a lot of experts out there and that's great. Go find those people. And there's a lot of great resources. Um, but I think there's perhaps a little bit of an opportunity for us in terms of community um, to kind of stitch together people that are kind of coming at it from the same place. You know, we're not looking for uh, an ATP career 
um, you know, or anything like that. So where do we derive meaning out of this? Why are we putting so much energy into this uh, at this stage? You know, uh, you know, we could be, you know, whatever, building retirement homes with this money <laughs> or whatever uh, that we're putting into the, our addictions. But, um, but I think everybody's got a passion for it and that's what's cool. So anyway, I'm, I'm looking forward to just hearing people's questions and, and uh, talking about whatever their challenges are and, and coming at it from the unique perspective that we're in. Obviously, we're open to those that are not midlife, but um, uh, currently alive also qualifies. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Let's jump into it then. So we are going to kind of have a topic um, each week that we're going to kind of lead with and want to cover some uh, ground on. And tonight we thought it'd be interesting, speaking of things that we're uniquely qualified to talk about, I think, which is... Um, kind of the production aspect, uh, ha- making videos and other content while, uh, training or while flying, like w- what goes into that? How do we do it? Um, how do we do it safely? Um, what are the, some of the tools we use? Um, just kind of an overview and answer. We, I, it is shocking, Brian, how, how many comments and questions I get about what's your setup? H- how are you filming these what cameras are you using? How do you mount them? How do you, how do you get your audio? That's one of the, uh, probably every video, there's a handful of co- people that want to know about those things. So I think it's going to be an interesting, uh, kind of an interesting topic. And I, we both have similar workflows, I think, but also different. Um, and so we're going to show just some sample clips here in a little bit and kind of talk through some of the facets. But I think the first thing, I've now gone off script already. If you haven't noticed, I have not looked at the Google Doc, so I may have no, like lost. No, the, we may have diverged already from the... <laughs> um, I think processes for filming safely, I think, is a is a, the question. Uh, I was pretty interested in that from the very beginning. Um, like, that was a big deal to me, like not letting it be a distraction. And it's led to, there have been some unintended consequences um, in terms of the filming production quality. So maybe we'll talk about that first. I'll just talk through my workflow and then maybe you can hit me with yours. I don't know that we've talked in depth about this, you and I. Um, I tried to, once I set up in the airplane, like for filming, I forget about it. So by that, I just mean like even before my pre-flight, so the first thing I do when I get to the hangar, even before I pre-flight the plane, typically is put, I put all my cameras up, power them, hook them up, check them out, make sure everything's good, all the audio is good and everything's there. And then I shut them all the cameras off again because before I even pre-flight or do anything. So it's kind of segregated in these little, it's got its own time and place. And so then I'll do my normal pre-flight routine, whatever else, pull the plane out. Although sometimes I'll start the exterior camera before I pull it out to use that shot of it kind of, you know, rolling out of the hangar or whatever. But then when I get in the plane to get ready to go, turn all the cameras on, start them recording, make sure they're recording, turn the audio recorder on, start it. Um, the only other time I think about them again is when after we started up the audio panels on, I look at my audio recorder to make sure I've got levels from the intercom. And then I don't think about the cameras again until we've landed and taxied off the runway and we're back. So the, the consequence of that is not checking them in the air. I've led to like flights where I get back and I don't have footage from one or more of cameras because something's happened or something went awry and or the audio messed up and I don't have audio. So um, but I think it's a good trade off. Um I think maybe down the road, you know, I think, I don't think there's anything wrong with glancing at a camera over your head, you know, making sure that the count timer is still running or whatever. Like I, I think you can do some of that stuff safely, but that's been my approach, which has just been, they've got their, you spend your time and energy on them before you start them and then you don't think about them again. Yeah. I think, I think, um, what I see a lot is people getting into their training and then having a point where all of a sudden they flip a switch and realize that they want to start recording their flights. And so maybe they're uh, coming up on their first solo uh, or something more momentous. That's the kind of thing that makes me a little uh, apprehensive when I hear about stories like that. Um, I went into it from the very beginning, even though at the very beginning I only had maybe one camera, I think, um, which is fine. Um, But I... I knew going into it that I didn't, I wanted it to be part of my muscle memory and my process before I even started so that it was never any kind of a, you know, you're experiencing enough saturation as it is when when you're learning. And so to have anything all of a sudden extra that you're thinking about is, even if it's 
just set it and leave it. It's still something you're kind of thinking about. And uh, so that's something I did. I made a choice to do, which was just, you know, so I guess the message there would be like, you know, uh, don't wait until something momentous and then freak out and then start trying to get the equipment together and, and all that, um, you know, figure it out when it's not as important to get the stuff so that by the time it happens, you're already in the routine. You've already had, you know, five different flights where cameras didn't work or the audio failed and, you know, all of that. I will say, and this is just a side note real quick, um, big shout out to in-flight cam. And we'll get more into the conversation about mounts and various technologies to use, but a uh, big shout out to in-flight cam, because I'll tell you this, uh, at, even though I am an experienced videographer and I'd started from the very beginning recording all of my uh, lessons, what happened was, I had switched planes a couple lessons before my, what I was thinking my solo would be. And all of a sudden I just couldn't get audio to work in this particular plane at all. Every time I flew it and I, and it was sort of like, it was coming up and it was coming up and it was the day before what I believed was going to be my solo. Um, I actually texted with the guy, I can't remember his name, who's the main in-flight cam guy, ended up calling me. And he basically said, uh, your audio cable, you know, if you've tried it on the left side, you've tried it on the right side, none of these things are working. He said, try it in the back seat, try it in one of the rear seats. Um, and then the morning that happened to be my first solo, I, I plugged it into the back seat, just hoped and prayed that it would work. And sure enough, it worked. So I would not have had audio from my first solo, even with all my experience leading up to that, had it not been for in-flight cam, a company <laughs> that sells this stuff, like actually calling me on the phone and, and made a memory for me possible that I would have not been able to capture. So big shout out to them. That's very cool. Yeah. I've, uh, I've worked with them as well on a couple of smaller projects. And we should also disclaim that we, uh, nobody's sponsoring. I mean, the stuff we're going to talk about tonight, all these products, we're not getting, there's no endorsement or anything, but, um, I did w- briefly have a, a, a conversation with them. In flight cam did give me a, um, one of their in flight mics, uh, that goes on a, a pair of noise canceling headphones like the Bose. You've seen, uh, Cecilia in a lot of our videos wearing those, that, um, that mic. Um, they make a ton of great stuff. I have a bunch of their, I've got other stuff of theirs too, mounts and other, um, other accessory products, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. But yeah, there's all kinds of tools that, um, they can go into that. So maybe we should talk about the setup itself. Do you think? Um, so we yeah. can kind of talk. I, we have slightly different approaches. I think you use more cameras maybe than I do normally. Um, I did at one point and then I've scaled that back over the time just for sake of post production. But, um, so my setup's pretty easy and there's actually, there's a Patreon video. F- for patrons of the channel um, on my Patreon that I did of the setup uh, for that. And so actually, I, had, I, have a quick, uh, I have a quick setup question for you. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, go for um, it. Because I want to hear this for sure. But I, my question to you would be, um, you're unique in the sense that you filmed to, to document your training, but at the same time, you were really developing an actual channel that you were, you know, openly inviting people into, as opposed to just kind of me where I'm a little bit more passively just kind of posting whatever. It's just kind of there. I'm not necessarily talking to the camera or, you know, things like that. So it, when you describe this setup and how it's evolved, I'm curious about how it also evolved with your, with your increasingly outward focus, uh, inviting people in. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. I mean, I think, camera angles matter. And if, so if you're going to have limited resources, like, so I use right now my current setup, I either use four, three, three to five cameras, depending on the complexity of the, and that's for like the actual on the airplane or in the airplane, um, filming. And then we have just a DSLR, like a Canon EOS R camera that we shoot a lot. Like if you ever see the standups or like the B roll, the footage from around the airport or like when we went on our trip, we'll show some clips of this in a minute. Um, we can kind of talk through some of that. And in fact, we'll play a video after I just briefly describe the setup. So three or four cameras, always a hundred percent of the time, the main overhead camera that hangs from above that looks forward, that can see the panel and like the back of our heads and out the windscreen. In my case, that's a, um, that is a GoPro eight, um, that is plugged into a battery, 
a battery brick, a USB battery brick in the back seat of the airplane. So I run a USB cable around and plug it in for power, and it's got power in the back. Um, then also the number two case. So if you only have one camera, I think that's the camera. If you're recording for training or for anything else, I think that's the one you want. You can see your instruments. You can see out the windscreen and you would probably use some form of audio adapter. Like Brian said, like in flight cams, audio adapter or something to plug in to get intercom audio into that camera. The number two camera for me didn't, wasn't always like this. You talk about the evolving with the channel used to be an outside camera or some other view of the airplane. Um, Since the channel start, the number two cam, if I only have two, I'm using the one that's in the front facing the facing me and whoever else in the plane. Cause I can, I could do a whole video with just those two if I had to. Um, In my case, that's a GoPro seven on a suction mount on the windscreen. Also in our planes plugged into a USB port on the panel for power. So what you're going to find is all the cameras I use inside are power. It didn't used to be, but I lost so much footage from dead batteries that I've, I don't mess with that anymore. <laughs> okay, so that's my number two. It's a GoPro 7 on a suction cup looking back. Then uh, if my third camera will be an outside angle. So that's a GoPro 7. Um, using mounts from in-flight cam, they make all different airplane mounts. You can mount some on uh, in the Cherokee now. We have one that's uh, our A&P installed for us. It's on the wing tip. It's in a screw, you know, where the wing tip attaches out on the edge of the wing. You can use a um, a strut mount, which if you've seen any of the shots, which will show um, under the wings of the Cessna or on the tail of the um, Cherokee. Um, that's a GoPro 7. It has a um, refuel. We'll put links to all this stuff in the show notes in the description too. Yeah, there's a good, that's like a, uh, that's like a strut mount, I think. Is that in-flight cams or is that somebody else? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so that's a good looking strut mount with a GoPro on it. I didn't bring my show and tell. Um, and I use a battery pack on it from refuel and it's super cool. We'll show you that the link to that website here shortly uh, to keep extra power going out there. And then any of the others are just accessories. You might stick a suction cup on a window looking out the other side that your exterior camera's not, like the other direction that your exterior camera's not looking so you can see everything to the right of the plane, the left plane, or whatever you want to do there. Um, and then for audio, this is where I veered off a little bit from the norm. I don't record audio on a GoPro. I have a separate uh audio recorder that sits in the back seat and it's it's a four channel audio recorder so it, i use a headphone jack from the back seat with an inline uh attenuation pad in line just to help bring the signal level down from head, head, head it doesn't solve all the problems we get real technical like it's a different impedance but that's all fine um and plugged into a quarter inch input of that so i record the intercom audio on one channel but that recorder also has a stereo microphone built into it i record that as well just to get the ambient noise in the cabin, the engine, the noise. And I mix, I time align all that and mix it again later in post. So that's where my audio uh, veers off. Downside, since there's no central clock, like keeping all of these things in sync, my audio does tend to drift over long flights. Um, So I'm continuously, like every 20 minutes or so, the audio, I've got to chop and move it like five frames of video one way or another just to help keep it in line. I've just learned what that looks like and it's pretty quick for me now, but it used to really kind of vex me. <laughs> that's basically my, that's basically my setup. That's a lot. <laughs> you want to run through, I mean, I'm going to play video and look at it. Yeah. I can talk over a couple of things of it here real quick. So here's, here's, here's the video from. And feel free for anybody else uh, in here to ask some questions. Yeah, we'll answer some questions about this too. So here's the video. So all this stuff that you're seeing here, this stand-up stuff is shot on a DSLR, Canon EOS R um, camera that we just kind of carry around. So here's the overhead. This is a GoPro 8. Here's a 7 uh, with an in-flight cam uh, wing mount. So that's sitting out on the strut there. GoPro 7 on a suction cup mount, which you can actually see. Uh, pause the video. You can see it suction cup there. Uh to the right of the kind of the cowling there. Um, there's the wing cam. That's super. I love that shot. I, I love that shot because it really shows the dynamics, just how good image stabilization has got in these GoPros. Like yeah. you can tell just how much that ca- plane is moving, but how perfect that picture is. Um, so that's a nice external camera. And then on this trip, I'm not sure that I used, um, I'm not sure. Oh yeah, I see it out there. I had a, I had a wing cam 
there it is. There's the GoPro five, just kind of looking out the wing uh, on the other one. So just with those three or four cameras, you can make a pretty dynamic looking, um, a pretty dynamic looking video. Uh, I have a question. Um, uh, Other people might have questions, but I have a question. Do you um, adjust for highlights so that the window, the, the view out the window is not blown out because you have a pretty equal exposure of inside the plane as well yes. as sort of the, the view outside the plane. And I see a lot of video that people make where they don't account for that. And to me, that that's like one of the simplest things you can learn to do to greatly improve. Uh, if you have one camera and that's the one you're using, it seems like, but it looks like you're doing a really good job of correcting that. Yeah, here's the trick. So it, the GoPros do have, you can get a little bit sophisticated with your GoPro if you choose to. There are some picture settings. So two different things that I do, specifically in this shot that you're seeing here in this overhead shot. So this is the hardest one to do that, right? Because the wind, the image out the windscreen is significantly more exposed than the stuff inside the airplane. It's just way brighter outside and darker in, inside. So two things I do. One is you can adjust the exposure value, EV. It's a it's um, abbreviated in your camera. So I always bring it down for fear of not blowing out highlights. So it's down like minus 0.5 or minus 1. But then on this camera specifically, and we'll show the links to this, this has an in-flight cam, a variable gradiated ND filter. So you hear people talk all the time, right? They call them prop filters sometimes. It's such a cliche word it's not a prop filter it's an it's a neutral density filter so basically it's a dark darker colored filter that goes over the lens that knocks some of the light down coming into the camera except this one it it's so it's a circular lens and in the the top half of it is dark but the bottom half is clear and it gradients right across the middle so what what it's actually doing here is in the middle like where the cowling starts and below it's not darkened but above that half line is darkened to knock some of the exposure so it helps kind of equal out that exposure in terms of uh the outside camera that's a that's a huge one if you want to get the look where you can see outside and inside the plane pretty consistently oh i I should talk about this too this is just one more little trick so you see me using four flight all the time uh what I'm doing in this uh is recording my ipad obviously just on my ipad recording the screen then in post production, I'm putting in this frame of an iPad around it, and then I make a whole other angle that is this front-on angle with the iPad overlaid, so I can just cut between it when I want to use the iPad versus when I don't. So I record the iPad and its audio because I do like to hear I like to hear four flights callouts um, and use that in the mix sometimes as well. I'm gonna look at Chad real quick. Right, we're going now. We're going all kinds of out of order here. I appreciate all the effort you guys put in to create content. Just learning how to fly the plane. Thank goodness for you guys. Yeah, I appreciate it. It's a lot of work to produce these, but it's. I tell you, in training, it was extremely helpful um, for me. Uh, just having video of all this stuff. Can I, That's can my I sh- setup, basically. Can I show an example of uh, you see that that one I have dimmed right now in the preview? That's yep. the back of the plane. I'd love yeah. to show this one because uh, if you activate that, because this is a great example of in the middle of training. Um, and I think this for a, for a lot of students, um, when you're learning how to do short field takeoffs specifically, it's so, it's, it's, it's so unnerving, right? <laughs> you're, you're like, okay, I, I'm just trying to like keep it straight down the runway. And now, and I still don't have all my sight pictures together and, and all of that, but now I've got to, you know, pop a wheelie down the runway. So um, I cannot express enough how it it gave me so much insight in my training to throw uh and it's an in-flight cam mount it's a tail mount that just goes right on the tie down ring but this is a great example of a video where i was you know like where is the wheel coming up how much is it coming up how close is the tail hitting the asphalt and it just gave me a real sense of you know because I remember, I would remember how it felt and how it looked to me when it was happening. But there's something convincing about uh, seeing the video evidence later to to come back and analyze. So yeah, I think that as much as as much as it's something where obviously you know 
it is sort of, you know, content or, or whatever. We all, we, we cover different levels of this, but you know, for, for me, the reason why I have a stupid amount of cameras is because I have a stupid amount of things that I need to understand, <laughs> you know, in training, I was like, I want to see what I'm doing. I want to see what the, you know, I have also, I very often get a shot of, uh, let's see the other one I get uh, for landings to go between the, the, this tail view, which you see a lot of people have, but then uh, where is the other angle? It's the, uh, maybe I didn't even use it on this one. Oh yeah, here it is. And then this angle. So uh, between the, between looking straight back and then be, being able to, you know, show this kind of uh, almost all the wheels, I was able to get a sense of when I'm watching this, I, I'm looking at, I can see the rudder. I can see my rudder inputs. I can see, you know, what wheels are hitting first. Um, you know, like obviously I kind of put that one down a little hard, it looks like, but <laughs> <laughs> let's see, <laughs> when, when was that? Um, but that's the thing is like, you know, and that's the other thing is I think that, uh, but that loops me back around, Chris, to what I think is so important about what you've been making that really differs from what a lot of people have done. Uh, and it really inspired me to do the same thing, which is it's warts and all, man. There's no pride here. Like we're all learning. Everybody is suffering through it. And it's really, you know, especially in the age of idealized vanity culture and Instagram and nothing's real and, you know, whatever. It's so refreshing to have just these verite actual representations of somebody just kind of pat battling through it. And so that's what uh, inspired me to kind of do the same thing. And, you know, obviously I don't have a huge following or a huge channel or anything, but, but I have received a lot of feedback from people that it, where it's been helpful to them. And, and that's really all it's about. So I feel like as much as it's nice to be an authority and be like, well, let me tell you exactly how to do a short field takeoff and what you need to do is this, right. and, you know, it's, I think even more powerful sometimes just to, you, there's a million experts, but there's a lot of like, let's show the failures and the, the struggle. Um, and it means that much more when you get it. Well, I don't know where, I don't know where my channel would have been without the failures. Truthfully. <laughs> I mean, and some of that early and some of that early, I mean, the theme it felt like there for a while was just like, no confidence or like I just, yeah. you know, things were went south and, and I did like showing that because I think, I think it is easy to fall into the trap that, um, you just see a lot of super pilots sometimes on YouTube, you know, where like you don't get to see all that. In fact, I'm going to tell a story. I haven't told many people this yet, but, um, I, I wish I had been recording when we got back from this trip. I mean, in fact, part two is going to come out, not this weekend, but the following of this trip. When we, when we got back from this trip, uh, to the Greenbrier or to the, uh, to Lewisburg and to the uh, hot springs area, I got fuel. We landed at Fairmont, got fuel. And then, um, I taxied the plane back. We turned all the cameras off the fuel pumps, taxi back to put it in the hangar. And I'm another guy, a pilot I know on the ground was talking to me on radio and while we were chatting and like goofing, you know, like talking about non-important things. I noticed my iPad's still recording. So I'm like, I got my, so I'm taxing between my two rows, the two rows of hangers, got my head down. I'm looking like this. I'm messing with my iPad, talking to this guy on the radio. And, um, I feel and hear the left wing tip scraping the hanger to the left. Mm. And, um, you know, so I, you know, I stop immediately, obviously. And like, so I'm freaked out. I thought, well, this is great. I've just like, I've just like messed the plane up royally and whatever. It ended up being not a big deal, like a nav light and a little bit of sanding and painting. I mean, it was not, there was nothing structural. I scraped a piece of sheet metal basically, but you know, I wished I had been recording. In fact, we, I talked to my wife about that after I said, you know, these are the, I would have, I would have posted that in about two seconds and said, this is why they tell you, they say, you know, I say like, don't do anything else for your taxing. Don't get the weather. Don't, screw around on your iPad. Don't you, you got to drive, you got to pilot that airplane until the engine shut down. And, uh, I didn't, I just ran the wing into a hangar. I could have been a person. I mean, I could have ran the plane into, you know what I mean? Um, it just was really kind of shocking to me that like the, I could do that, but I did. Anyway, the point is I would have showed it if I'd been recording, but I wasn't. Well, a, a specific example too, of, um, a, a, an issue that you had that I also had, um, is I remember in one of your earlier stages of training videos, 
you had, and I'm not sure if you actually filmed it or it was just you referencing it later, but it was basically you had left the flaps uh, in and were looking to oh, take off. Oh, that was legendary. Hold on. I'll, you go ahead and talk about it. I'll show it. it was, that was a legendary I cannot event. tell you how much I identified with that because, and I don't know, maybe you planted it in my mind subconsciously because I did the exact same thing. And let me tell you, uh, there are two moments in my training where I was scared to the point of kind of such fear that it was actually kind of paralysis. And that's kind of what scared me the most about it is that, you know, my, if, if my instructor wasn't there, like I would have been in trouble um, at that stage in my training. And uh, when you talked about leaving the flaps in and then doing that thing where I was it Tyler called it, it was like, wheelbarrowing oh, he, or something yeah like wheelbarrowing um, across the runway oh yeah yeah it, was, it freaked and, me out pretty good too i thought that i was i thought we were done i thought i was going off this runway and so anyway i it i had that experience i have video of that experience and i have yours to sort of correlate that experience and let me tell you how many times i have forgotten to put the flaps back up since never yep uh, and so I think it really does, you know, cement these things uh, when when you have a document of that and somebody to reference. Oh God, uh, that was so scary. I got to show it. I, I think I found it here, and uh, this is now we're getting a little off, a little off track. But that's uh, rare to do. Yeah, exactly. So let me see if this is indeed the moment that I think it is. That doesn't work, does it? I cannot full screen. That's a bummer. All right, so uh, here's the landing. I think this is the one. I think it was the first one of the day. I put carb heat in, and I started. Oh to, yeah, there you I go. I started to put power again. <laughs> uh, must not have been that one because Tyler has not taken over, or did he? Oh yeah, here we oh, go. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. See, we're flying. Yeah, that that really. It seems minor to look at now. Now he's laughing at me. Uh, you got to put the flaps up, he said. I probably had, uh, let's see, I had seven hours at that point, right? Mm -hmm. So um, those are the kind of moments, though, man. You're right. I didn't forget it. I didn't forget that feeling ever. Uh, that was exciting. And m memorializing that in video in such a way where you, you, you stamp it to yourself and put it on the internet, you know, it's like the even more uh, inspiration to not forget something. So, yeah, between that and the only other moment I had, I don't know if you had a moment like this, but I was in check ride prep and I'd never had a problem doing stalls before. Um, but for whatever reason, I think it was maybe a lot of wind and I don't know. My instructor said more right rudder and boy, I really gave him a lot of right rudder and we were in a power on stall and got a nice wing over and sort of incipient stage. Uh, and that was the other time where I was so scared because it was just, uh, when things happen that you don't expect that are that dramatic, it's just, especially when you're later on in the training where you, you feel like you've kind of seen some things, you know, so that's another one where it's like, I'm going to memorialize this. Uh, I mean, it was his controls and then me just fighting mentally the rest of that flight to just try to put one foot in front of the other. But in retrospect, what an incredible perfect preparation for the check ride that, that was that is exactly what i needed to have happen if it if something like that happens on a check ride if it's you know that's bad but it's also about how you put it together after and i think that a lot of the mental struggle of fortitude and having a short memory is a strange balance in, in learning how to fly and and so for me just being like you know what i'm making peace with myself i'm edit there's something about editing the video and putting it together and releasing it that actually is sort of like an existential process to me it's like i've processed this i've i've reconciled with this with myself i'm pushing it out into the ether and i don't ha i don't have to watch it again but i've 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 been through it you know so right. that's kind of maybe a little bit more metaphysical b benefit to this but uh but yeah it looks like we got some some uh some feedback in here yeah kevin uh kevin asked what software do you use to bring all this footage together i believe you use a mac well he knows he knows me well i'm a fanboy from way back uh but what do you suggest ah, this for, is for a, me isn't it for a pc i'm gonna just hand this one off to brian <laughs> brian what do you suggest for a pc hey so look you know when you when you need a real computer that has real power uh, that doesn't cost you know like the price of a aston martin 
No. Um, so for PC, and it's actually available for Mac or PC, but I, I use DaVinci Resolve. Um, I do have the paid version of it, but it's um, not even very expensive. But the free version is incredibly powerful and not very limited. For most people, it will do just fine. Um, and the other thing I like about DaVinci Resolve is it's actually, in my opinion, the premier sort of color grading uh, platform as well. But the editing is incredible. The audio suite's incredible. I would highly recommend uh, DaVinci Resolve. The thing about the, because I'm also sort of anti-Adobe at this point because I, I'm just done with monthly subscriptions for everything. Like, you know, it's like now it used to be you could buy the software and then like, okay, I'm done with it. I have it. And then I'm on an upgrade path and thank you very much. And that's what DaVinci Resolve does. These people that are charging these you know, like over the last eight years or whatever that I'm using Adobe products, what, how many, how much money have I given them for all this software now? It's like, you know, uh, so we could, you know, we can differ about it. We can, we yeah, can arm uh, wrestle. Yeah. I have a different take on it, but, but, but yeah, but DaVinci Resolve is the here, PC right? solution, but yeah. <laughs> I mean, no, does, let's have I, it out. Let's have it out. It's a little off topic. Well, my, okay. I'll hear my five second rebuttal. I, so I used to feel that way. And then I realized also though, um, you know, like if you used to buy the, if you, if you bought the entire Adobe creative suite, I mean, I'm saying like the whole thing, like yeah. Photoshop, Lightroom, InDesign, After Effects, uh, Premiere, Audition, uh, Dreamweaver, like the whole package you were going to spend. And I'm talking like before the subscription model existed, you were, it was, you were in the th- many thousands of dollars for the whole. Yeah. And then that would, that would, that would preclude you from updating as well. Like, if I spent that money, it, I'm not like I can guarantee you in two or three years I'm not spending it again. Yeah. So my take is I pay I don't know what it is twenty dollars a month or whatever it is, so a couple hundred dollars a year um, for the whole suite, and I figure I am constantly on the latest software. So like I don't know, it's I see both. I, I know there's some another one of my friends who's in here is also anti subscription model, but um, anyway, yeah, it's it okay. Let's see here, <laughs> but you're right, uh, Da Vinci. Da Vinci is a uh, is a purchase, and so is Final Cut Pro. You buy it once if you're on a Mac. You buy Final Cut Pro. I use Final Cut Pro on my Mac. You buy it once, and then you have it as well. It's not a subscription. But I do like that the for Da Vinci Resolve, though. Just to be very clear, the free version is really all that 95 percent of people really ever need, and it is profound. It is fantastic. Yep, very good. Um, let's see headset questions. R. Boydston, why did you choose your headset? I think he asked that or she when I was playing my clip, but you can talk about your headset too. I think you're using, well, we'll talk. Can you compare them to Lightspeed Zulu? I cannot because I have actually never used a Lightspeed Zulu. I have used a, I've used someone else's Bose A20s, which are kind of like, that's what everybody's, that's like the gold standard. I use David Clark uh, DC uh, 1X um, uh, noise canceling headset and I have loved every second of it. It's got all the features that the, um, that the Bose do, uh, Bluetooth, um, independent left and right volume controls, excellent noise cancellation and they're super lightweight. I- I've been, uh, I could not be happier with my David Clarks and I, I should know, Brian, I don't even remember what, I don't remember what your headset is. I have like whatever the regular, David Clark, no noise. Old like school. Just like, you can like hear you your look engine. Up headset in the dictionary or whatever, like whatever the picture is of that. That's that's what I have. And my logic was really um, pretty simple, which is I don't know, especially when you're coming up through training, you don't know what's what's best, and you really shouldn't be that concerned with with that. Really, I think at that point, and I also was not wanting to use noise reduction anything because I I'm a very you know uh, audio <laughs> sound. Uh, aware person and I wanted to hear everything. I want to hear the engine. I want to hear the air over the plane and how it changes. I wanted to hear everything. I, I was not, I don't, I don't, it's not like it's so loud with those non noise reduction that it's, you know, like my ears are sore after or something. It's fine. Right. And I'm not flying, you know, nine hour flights or whatever. So to me, if I was ever going to recommend anything to anybody, I would say save your money get the most out of whatever you can get out of the cheapest headset. And then, you know, and then you can always upgrade and then you'll give that to your significant other or your friend. And that'll be your loaner set or, or, or whatever. But uh, I use the, just the regular David Clark's. Uh, Billy Hopkins, do flight schools use cameras to show the students? That seems like valuable information. Some do. Uh, I don't think yours did Brian. And I don't know here that it's part of a routine, but I have seen, 
I've talked to other people online in various forums like this that their school d- does use video, maybe not for every lesson, but there are specific um, contexts where they use them. It is extremely useful. Uh, it was super helpful to me, I know, and I'm sure there are people who use that. Um, uh, Indiana says... I agree. Please don't ever edit out the real world. Aviating, the more real, the better. That's when you're talking about showing the mistakes. I agree with that as well. Uh, let's see what else we've got. Kevin. It's, it's hard. It's hard, Chris, to, to share, right? When you're early on and you're looking back at it and you're like, like another thing I really identified with was when you were doing your first, uh, you were doing your first night landings and I had the exact same experience where it's almost like a carbon copy. You could play my video next to yours and it would almost be the same. It's me telling, asking my, we're on final and I'm, you know, checking my instructor. Like, are you, are you with me? You're, are you on this? You're like, are you, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, like, okay, this is super weird, you so know, weird. And so anyway, just of course, keep it, you know, all real world aviating. But I mean, I think it's even further about just sort of a vulnerability that, just, you know, you're, you're not, it's not, a, you can film everything that's real, but it's also about how you're interacting with what's happening and just being transparent about how you're feeling, you know, which is huge. What, um, in terms of your setup, uh, for cameras and audio. So you mentioned uh, maybe even in the pre-show, I don't think you said your audio configuration in that story or did you, was it in this or the pre-show? And then, um, what cameras are you using oh, yeah. uh, on your yeah. videos? And so I, I have uh, this standard GoPro and a Hero Eight for the cockpit view. Nothing fancy there; it just sticks right to the side there. <laughs> and then I have a couple of these uh, Hero Eights with the in-flight cam uh, strut mount. These things are made so well, and these straps are unbelievable. They look maybe chintzy, but they are, I mean, the, the sturdiness of these is pretty incredible. Um, then I have, let's see. Uh, I have another one that I use for the cockpit view sometimes. Uh, that's just another in-flight cam. That's got a, uh, bendy arm. I like this one because it has one point of loosening and tightening that'll allow you to do all of the bendiness. Uh, and yeah. Adjust- that's like, that's like a magic arm. We use it in the TV yeah. business all the time. It's magic yeah, that's really cool. Yep. And then I got the filter that goes over because this is the one that if I do overhead, it'll be the one that you know makes the propeller be smooth. Um, I've had a lot of trouble. Um, the plane that I like and fly most often, the 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 hood liner or whatever you want to call it, is not really um, hmm, structurally sound. It kind of flops <laughs> down, and so I can't really hang this dead center over the middle. And get that shot. I just can't. And I and since it's a you know rental or whatever, I can't just glue you know a a mount up you know adhere a mount up there. So I've had that. That's you know, and I think that's important. I mentioned too is that just because other people are doing it doesn't mean you're gonna be able to. You might have to just deal with different types of shots or different types of things. Just get the most out of it that you can. I, I try to just lean it over to where I can at least see some of the gauges. You know, and it's nice to have that really nice center line kind of rear view, but um. But I don't have that. Um, That's right. And then, um, uh, and then the probably the most important thing is uh, this cable, which is the in-flight cam cable. So uh, there it is. Yeah. yeah. So if people, I don't know if people have seen that. Um, so here, here's here's the magic of that. Those cables will let you, if you have an airplane, a lot of people have airplanes with only two uh, position intercoms. I've just been lucky that all the planes I've flown have four positions, so there's back seat jacks. So I have spare jacks in the back to use for my recording. It, the nice thing about that in-flight uh, cable there is that it is a Y splitter, so you can plug one of them into the headphone jack at your position and then plug your headset, one of the two connectors your headset, into the Y side of that. So in addition to going to the camera, uh, it also powers your headset, so um, those work yeah, really good, good. Yep, those yeah. work really well for that. And so Let I use show. all all Hero Eights. I just, I you know, w- when I got all this stuff, that I could have gone Hero Nine, or now you can get the Ten, I guess. But I just thought uh, I got all refurbished ones uh, for the cheapest possible outcome. Let me show. Um, let me not show that. Let me show um, In Flight Cam's website <clears throat> real quick. Um, and I bring it up just because there are so many products from here that we've been talking about here. 
Um, this exterior ball mount, I don't know if you can, I don't know how well this is showing up on the stream. This is oh, yeah. what I use for that overwing shot that we just saw in the, um, Cherokee. This literally an AMP needs to do it or sign off on it. Um, this goes in a screw around the, uh, wing tip, uh, where the wing, the, the kind of the, um, fiberglass or the composite material wing tip uh, is, atta- is attached. Um, and then it has these little bolts. You can adjust the angle of that. And that is super cool. Uh, that's what I use for the outside. Here's the strut mount that, uh, Brian was talking about that mounts to the strut of a, of a, of a Cessna, for instance. You can see it in action here. It is attached to the strut there for some really cool exterior shots. Um, I'm looking for the case that they make that I have on my, oh yeah, here we go. Check this out. They make these big, metal cages um uh these are just like big extra support cages for gopros um extra secure and tight um if you're going to use them outside you know places that you need a little extra rigidity you can do that um and those are super cool and then there's another place called flight flicks f-l-i-g-h-t-f-l-i-x dot net they have a, another very nice selection of um, camera accessories as well for their stuff, um, including prop filters, safe cases. This is actually the one that I have um, for my interior camera. It's from Flight Flix, and they make this. I'll show you that gradient ND filter. So basically, it looks like this. Um, it's a case like this, and it puts a big ring around the GoPro lens, and then they have a round filter that goes um, that goes over that. So that's super cool. Uh, Flightflix.net. We'll put that stuff in the as well as in-flight cams links and stuff in the. I do have another notes. camera I'd like to share, Chris. Yeah, do it. This is another one I'm about to start filming with. Nice. <laughs> is that a? Uh, it is Bolex? a Rolex. Yeah, it's a Bolex 8mm yeah. film camera from 1959. And I'm getting ready to shoot a bunch of B-roll with it. I will not be mounting this to the plane. <laughs> uh-huh. Well, you only get like, how much is on the film? Like uh, seven minutes of shooting or something? If you, Yeah, maybe four minutes. It's the old kind where you flip it. You flip the film. Okay. Uh, but anyway, I, I've got a, a documentary I'm working on that's aviation related. And... Uh, I've got some is, archival stuff from my dad's. Uh, you want me to show it? Oh, yeah. Well, I can show this, this little clip here. Oh, yeah. I've got some way cool stuff that my dad uh, shot from a you know, C-130 or C-123. Um, and so I'm just excited about in this documentary that I'm making, I want to marry up. I want to have – if you go into a, a 1978 Cessna and as long as you don't show the GPS – <laughs> it's not gonna it'll it's timeless right so right. anyway that's that's awesome but yeah so um but yeah i mean the, the the editing and the audio i mean i think that um you know you've you've figured out how to make all that work i think it's also important to figure out what to leave in and what to leave out if you're actually trying to build an audience i didn't do that i was just sort of throwing stuff out there i think you've been really good chris about knowing how to i've gotten what, better what to include and what not to I've gotten better, and that is um, my videos aren't the public publicly released videos are no longer an hour and a half; they're like fourteen minutes or whatever. Uh, mm. That's really the trick. Um, because I put this lower third up, I'm going to read this question yeah. out of topic, uh, but it's good. Nathan said, "Have you ever just used your phone camera and iPad?" Absolutely. For some of the not for the flying portion, just because I don't have a good way to put it anywhere. My Anybody who's with me, t- my t- daughter has shot tons of footage for me on an iPhone with a specific app or with her camera set to the settings that I need her to have. But uh, yeah, we shot with the with the iPhone. I've shot stand-ups when I've forgotten to take a DSLR with me. Um, but content is key. Uh, and so, like this, the the most recent one that was the anniversary video, I think was uh, I don't know, twelve minutes long or something, and we cut out a ton. That was a pretty long flight getting there. Really, it's the like departure, a handful of stuff in the middle. If we do anything while in flight, 
the arrival and the landing. And then we, tr- I've been trying more and more to make more stories out of these, you know? So like most of this, the cool thing about this trip was if you haven't seen it yet, it's on the YouTube channel. It's part one of the anniversary trip was there was a TBM convention going on here and there were 95 TBM airplanes on the ramp at Lewisburg when we landed. Um, and so that was super cool to see. Uh, I'm also watching my landing again cause I don't remember if it was worth watching again. Uh, <laughs> but now we've committed, so we're just going to let it roll at this point and see what actually happens here. A little bit of right um, rudder. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, on the, I mean, yeah, Great. that was acceptable. Um, but, yeah, but there was 95 ton, so, TBMs. That's a lot of money on the field. Oh, my God. It was $104 million, the airport manager told me, <laughs> worth of airplanes. And, <laughs> So we get down here. We I tried to turn the last few minutes of this. Um, I'm trying to tell more of the stories of where we're going, you know, make it about the flying. Here's a bunch of TBMs. That's iPhone video. This is iPhone video right here. Um, so I do blend it into my stuff a lot. And this is EOSR. Did a little time lapse of the control tower. Um, EOSR. Them putting the plane away. TBMs. So we I just tell a little story. I was just going to say, I really like in this one when... Uh, iPhone. This is all iPhone video here. When you Go roll ahead, up to the, the airport and they run you around the back like you're the riffraff that, that doesn't need to be at the airport or something, you know? But then, exactly. but then you, get, but you get back there and then they come up to your window like it's, uh, you know, well, welcome, Mr. Moran. How are you today? You know? Right. <laughs> they, were right. So, they were so kind. Yeah, it was great. That was a great experience. This was a cool little airport we didn't get to actually fly into, but up near Hot Springs, Hot Springs, Virginia, that area is really something um, in that whole area. Anyway, it's a good trip. So telling more stories like that, that's kind of the thing. And also the next series that will be coming on the channel will be um, instrument ratings. Supposed to have my first instrument lesson tomorrow, but it's uh, weather's not going to cooperate for that. Oh, the irony. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not looking super promising. I have a question about instrument rating, uh, turning that corner. Um so I'm assuming you have not built all the cross country time that is needed for it, right? I am very close. Oh, okay. Um, I'm, it's not that much. Uh, okay. I guess I'm just wondering. It's it's like if you have that much time to to, to burn to get to that, uh, is it really worth trying to turn the corner right then, or is it going to be better to maybe I don't know? Get, I get your feet wet. I have. Here's what's cool. You need to have. Uh, it's, it's kind of surprising, really, the, the regulations. 10 hours of um, cross-country airplane pilot and command PIC time. 50 hours total PIC cross-country. I have 40.5 of the 50. Then you need 40 hours of actual or simulated instruments. So what's really going to happen here is, and you only need 15 instruction. Well, I have three already in private, okay? We're not going for the bare minimum here, but we're going to have a few hours with an instructor at the beginning of the training. Then me and a bunch of the other club members or other private pilots are just going to go out and burn time together, safety piloting and like wearing the hood and just flying, you know, building that time. Um, And then you need one 250-mile instrument cross-country airplane uh, with an instrument approach at each airport and three different kinds of approaches flown. Um, and then you take your check ride or your, and your knowledge test. I'll knowledge test them. Check ride. So let's see. Oh, well, this is great. We got a ton of stuff coming in. Uh, here's a good question. Great question. Steven wants to know, Brian, do you also fly with an mm-hmm. iPad? What mounts do you like for that? If so, a uh, good question. Yeah, so I, I <laughs> let me tell you how bad it hurt to have to buy an iPad to use for flight, Chris. <laughs> let me just tell you how bad it hurt to spend yep. that much money on a stinking tablet. But it's been great. Um, so yeah, I have the uh, whatever this one is. Uh, I put tape on it because it's already coming up. The iPads are made so cheaply, like the stuff comes oh, apart. But yeah, um, just but anyway, but I have it, it works. <laughs> It works great. In terms of the mount, honestly, um, uh, it's back there. I, I, I found this weird company that no, I never had heard of before that sold uh, the sort of cheapest mount in the world uh, for, <laughs> for iPads. Um, and I can't remember. I can't remember the name of it. I'm trying to find it here. Um, so yeah, I use a 
I use a RAM mount. I have an iPad Mini 5. I use a RAM uh, mount, the one with the little squeezy fingers that like come out and then make mm-hmm. like an X. And it, I use it on the yoke, and it works great in both planes, the Cessna and the Cherokee. It's perfect. And that's a Mini. I think that's a Mini, Brian, that you just held up. It looks yeah, like it. Yeah, yeah. That is the perfect size. People get crazy. I'm sorry, and I'm sorry if it's any of you who are on here. People get crazy with those big iPads and the iPad Pros and that stuff in a little teeny 172 or a little Cherokee or whatever, it's crazy. There's not room for that. I mean, the mini is the perfect size, in my opinion, for those things. I mean, we got tons of questions. Well, the, by the way, the, the mount, uh, the more, I already noticed a lot of, when this is on the control, on the yoke, you can feel the sort of weightiness of it, you know? So I, I, I want to have this little of an imposition on the controls if you're mounting it on the yoke. So I can't imagine having a big one on the yoke. It's, Ivy, Ivy Geiler is here. Her husband, uh, BG, is um, a student pilot in our flying club, flying the 172. He agrees nice. 100%. He fought the purchase. Uh, we're also dealing with uh, uh, other anti-Apple around me. And Kevin, his instructor, would like to remind him that it has worked great for him uh, in there <laughs> as well. Lots of iPad. This is always a great topic. Steven uh, just got the new iPad Mini. They are awesome. Oh, yeah, here's one. This is great. Uh, Stinky Weasel <laughs> says uh, he rocks the iPad Pro with a kneeboard. That's one way to do it. I never, I, I, I started with a kneeboard for my iPad, but I didn't like the, I didn't like the, I didn't like the view. Uh, I didn't like having to look down that far, but I know a lot of people that do that. Um, what else we got here? That's a good question. Uh, Instrument training will be interesting. Looking forward to that series. Yep, that's going to be a good one. I'm very excited to get that started. Well, because primarily I got burned two more times, couldn't go on trips just because of a cloud layer. I'd have been in the clouds about 30 seconds of a two and a half hour trip and couldn't go because I couldn't get out of Fairmont, which is um, <laughs> the last straw. <laughs> it was just like, I'm doing this tomorrow. I'm starting right now. Exactly. That was basically what I did. Uh, not just an FPV. I got to say for just starting the live streaming thing, you guys are doing great at flipping and switching views. Thank you very much. We're learning the tech. I mean, I've, I did this for a living. I, I mean, I worked in radio and television and directed and TD'd a lot of, uh, telecast, but it is very hard. It is very hard to, to address the camera, to frame the shots, right. And to like run the chat and the mix and the whole thing at the same time. I'm finding this to be very, uh, very difficult. Mm, let's see. Kevin Schwartz says, have you tried a suction mount on the side? And if you had, how does that compare to a yoke mount? Um, I've flown, I, I've been in a plane with someone with it on the side window. It works fine. I think some people are always like, Oh, the, um, you know, you lose your reference there out the side. I, I think it's, you're probably, you can see around it. Um, I think it would work fine. A mini probably. I still think anything bigger than that is too big for, um, it's too big for a little plane. Uh, student Aviator tried to get a kneeboard for his iPad. They're out of stock till the end of November. I guess I we'll have to settle for a yoke mount. You won't settle. It will be. It'll be quite. Um, I will say the one I got, it. as much as it's the cheapest one ever, that I it's some weird off brand, like some fly by night company. Um, a lot of sometimes if I if I mount it beforehand and then I'm out pre flying the plane and I'm checking the, the ailerons and it it turns the steering wheel and the thing will just go flopping right out. I'm just like, oh my God, it's not it's not the best mount. And then um, okay, so then you're over here like this cheap iPad, the thing's coming on on done, but you're like, <laughs> tell me you've flung it across the cabin like I bought the cheapest one because I wasn't sure. I'm mean, like these folks, right? Like I wasn't sure I didn't want to spend a bunch of money on some crazy ram mount thing or whatever if I wasn't even sure cuz I was kind of still kneeboarding it and I just wasn't even sure how I was going to use it. So I didn't want to spend a lot of money. I just tried it, but I need to get something better. So if anybody knows of a better yoke mount, let me know. Kevin Coon, who's my first passenger as a private pilot, uh leaving Fairmont is a strong emotional state. It is a uh it's not for the weak faint of heart, although it really isn't a terrible uh, airport to get in and out, but there, it's definitely not, uh, it's not a big place. So how long yeah. is it? Oh, it's long. It's, I mean, it's I'm just under 3000 feet, 28, depending on which way you're going based on the displaced threshold, it's like mm-hmm. 28 or 20, 2800 feet, maybe. And five, two is 150 horsepower, 145. I, it's 
you know, it's, it is exciting on a hot, on a hot summer day. I can tell you that, <laughs> but we've hit the hour mark. Um, and we said we wanted to be respectful of that for a lot of reasons. Um, any closing thoughts, Brian, anything, uh, I just want to shout out to one dull geek here who said, uh, (laughs) PC guy uses DaVinci Resolve, hated having to buy an iPad. He says, Brian, you and I must have been separated at birth. Um, The only other thing that would have really brought this home is... um, that you misspelled separated and I'm a spelling nerd. So like that would, that would have been like the last <laughs> thing. Uh, no, but I'm just kidding. One dull geek. Now uh, that I showed it. No, I've, 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 I've watched his videos. He makes, he makes good videos. And, uh, and so I appreciate him being here. And, um, and, uh, yeah, it is, it's a, you know, sometimes you got to play both sides to win and that's what we're doing here. It's just, you just take what, what you can get. Uh, you know, I guess you can just be like a Garmin pilot guy. Is that what it is? Garmin, whatever. That is know. what it is. But don't do that. But the thing that I don't want to be brand loyalist. People have their own. I, that's also not my yeah. hill to die on. But I will say that I, I've a four flight has been great for me. I mean, I will I'm say sure. that the bummer though is since I don't have an iPhone, I don't have an automatic backup of this, and so for filing flight plans, that's where it's annoying because I have to tether and I have to do all this stuff. So if you get any satisfaction from it being harder for me. Uh, because I'm still in the sort of non Apple world, then it, you can at least know that filing flight plans is a pain. Very cool. Well, we appreciate everybody watching <laughs> this. Uh, this podcast will be available. What? I just I'm I'm watching the clock, man. I'm trying to like I'm used to hard outs in media too. It's one like we don't get to just saying, sorry. Oh, one dull geek saying sorry for the misspelling. Sorry, you're you're fine. You're fine. Don't worry about it. Uh, and I appreciate everybody's great comments. Student aviator. Um, you call us gentlemen. That's a stretch, but we'll we'll take it. Awesome. Thank you guys for being here. It was a great first show. Uh, we'll get more refined as we get going and um, hope to keep doing this content. Also, as always, leave comments, leave us some uh, topic suggestions. Uh, we'll have some guests coming up here in future episodes. Every, is it every Wednesday we're doing this? True. Every Wednesday night, eight o'clock Eastern, uh, we'll be recording and then we'll get on a schedule for publishing them as well. We'll get that thing go with the audio versions as well. In case you miss a video. Um, Brian, thank you. A pleasure yeah thanks man good times and uh and uh we'll it'll be cool that we have a lot to talk about and the next next week uh sort of topic of conversation i think people will really like not that we've decided fully on what it is we just know it'll be great it'll be great thanks for being here everybody until next time uh we'll talk to you soon so long